Well, the Yukon is on fire. I'm going to be talking about an analogy with the Golden Triangle, and we'll talk a little bit about critical minerals as well. But through my coverage on the South Side independent research of a number of companies in the Golden Triangle, GT Gold, Imperial Metals, vis a -vis Red Chris, Ascot, Dolly Varden, Skeena, um, I've come up with really a lens, an analyst lens, that I think the Yukon's on fire in terms of the momentum it has, some of the discoveries, some of the senior mining companies move in. So let's get right at it. So the outline really is pretty straightforward. I'm gonna talk about the Northern Cordillera Copper and Gold Province. I wanna really get everyone that framework of what we're gonna be talking about. You'll see a map in a second. The Golden Triangle, what were the key success factors to make that so prolific in terms of discovery in M&A? The Yukon status as a potential proto-Golden Triangle. And then finally, key takeaways and tailwinds. Okay, here's a map of the, what we're calling the Northern uh, Copper and Gold uh, Province. This is 400 million ounces of gold in resources, 200 million pounds of copper. So what we're looking at is all the way from Mount Milligan through the Golden Triangle area in Northern BC into the Yukon and then all of Alaska. So this is a real, you know, mega mineral province to put it into context. One of the attractions, some of these deposits, to the seniors at least, has been the long mine lives. Pogo and Fort Knox over 20 years and then Greens Creek over 40 years. Now one important thing to look at here is in 2012, this was the map as far as the senior mining company's involvement went. So you can see over here, Barrick with their Donlin interest, Anglo was there at Pebble in 2012, Sumitomo was the majority interest of Pogo, and then Kinross is up here with Fort Knox. Hecla has Greens Creek. Barrick is actually here with Galore Creek. That's the only senior mining company in BC, and then Yukon, nada, okay? Okay, let's fast track to 10 years. Looks what, look what has happened. We've got a cluster of senior mining companies, whether it be investments or M&A down here in the Golden Triangle. Um, from that prolific period, especially in the last five years. And then Yukon, whether it be strategic investments, joint ventures, purchases like Heckler's buying of Keno Hill. Um, it's surprising what's happened in the last few years for the Yukon. And I would say a lot of it, a lot of it is driven by the uh, Golden Triangle success. So here's the M&A result. Look at Alaska, 0.4 billion. The Yukon, 0.6. Look at the Golden Triangle, $4.4 billion. Okay, so I would say Yukon's a bit behind. But this is a global focus for investors. The Golden Triangle has had success. It has drawn in the senior mining companies, in particular Newcrest, and with that come the big blue chip institutional investors. Okay, it's been surprisingly limited, the Golden Triangle production pre-2015. That's, that's just a fact. Here's the historic producers, SK Creek, Premier at 2.6, SNP at 1.1, and then Dolly Varden, Scotty, Grand Duke, et cetera, just over a million. So look at the punchline here. At the bottom there, you can see that the, and I'll go to both sides here, the Golden Triangle versus the rest of Canada in terms of belts has only produced 9.3 million ounces, which is over here. So despite its stature, it's actually early innings for the Golden Triangle. Okay, the three key reasons for this transformation. Number one, outstanding geology. And we'll go through that in a little bit of detail, not too much. Number two, First Nations collaboration has been huge. And finally, new infrastructure. I won't go into detail right now, I've got another slide. It's been a game changer. Oh yeah, marketing. I think the BC regional uh, alliance, there was a partnership between First Nations, companies, and government, it was extremely powerful, probably started in 2017-18. This involved government officials coming to 
investment conferences and uh, chairing sessions, Peter Robb, the ADM, for example, for British Columbia, focused on the Golden Triangle. There's no other focus in BC. So that was very, very important for the government of BC to do that. Marketing. Okay, outstanding geology, really briefly, um, it's a world-class slice of geology. It's essentially a bunch of stacked arcs, uh, very much like the Philippines geology. And uh, where you see those red lines, this is part of the green and, and orangey geology where you have major breaks. These are unconformities, they call them the red line. Okay, that's been the loci for a lot of these deposits, including Red Chris, um, amongst others, uh, Bruce Jack, to some extent, Ascot. Um, and so it's been very important. The other thing that's very important, and for anybody with Newcrest in the crowd would certainly agree, they've got these spe very special type of porphyry that has a lot of potassium, and I'll leave it there, but very similar to Cadia Ridgeway. And Katie Ridge weighs a million ounces per year production. It's, it's a mega district, and that's the prize, and that's why Newcrest is here. Was able to tour some fund managers there last September. Um, it's got precious metal VMS, obviously, SK Creek, one of the highest grade deposits in the world, probably the highest grade VMS. And finally, epithermal and intrusive related gold, uh, really putting Predium in that bin, as well as Ascot's uh, Premier. Okay, and in terms of that geology, I've just outlined that is the definition of the Golden Triangle. It's that particular slice that has been the most prolific and is branded as the Golden Triangle. Okay, First Nations collaboration. This is uh, important. I'm going to click through some milestones. Try and read with me here. Okay, SK Creek production 1998. The Toltan were very involved in terms of catering contracts, trucking contracts, it really kind of socialized mining to that First Nation, even though they'd had a pretty extensive previous uh, history, but not production in the same regard. Nishka Treaty in 2000. The Taltan Nova Gold Agreement uh, in 2004, if, if uh, Sue Craig's in the audience, she was one of the key architects. Revenue sharing vis-a-vis -vis the BC government. I've got a slide on this next. This was a game changer. Collaborative IBAs, I think they went from something that didn't have a lot of nuance to a lot of nuance and impact, actual change the way that the flavor of the impact benefit agreement was constructed. Lots more sophistication. And yeah, this is the SK revitalization project. This is a milestone agreement, finally signed off just in January with the Taltan. Uh, federal government, Skeena, and the provincial government. It falls into the, I think I've got one more here, the first ever under UNDRIP. I won't get into details, but there is a United Nations Indigenous Rights Framework to permit in British Columbia. Okay, so that's the first one. It really involves the Taltan having a seat at the table as far as permitting, and for SKA, that's a good thing. So revenue sharing, I just want to take a moment here because this is... Uh, this is key to aligning First Nations in the Golden Triangle, in particular the Toltan and the Nishka, with uh, 17 agreements, about 10 million a year, case by case basis. It's from the BC Minerals Tax. It's not out of the company's part of the uh, profits and revenues. It's out of the BC Mineral Tax, what the government has. And the first one in the Golden Triangle was Red Chris in 2015. And finally, uh, Bruce Jack, uh, in 2018, and in the pipeline premier in 2024, we predict, and then SK in 2025. So these are all in the Toltan territory, plus or minus the Nishka. Power infrastructure. Anybody see the Kevin Costner Field of Dreams movie? Uh, any baseball fans? Anyway, this is when I was uh, president of the Chamber of Mines for British Columbia, because it was called that instead of NBC. We had a vision that if you build the infrastructure, Highway 37 power up from uh, Terrace up through to Dees Lake, that you will get the investment to come. And at that time, Carol Taylor um, was the finance minister and thought it was a subsidy, so she killed it. Richard Newfield came in as Minister of Mines, had some sway after she left, and he, he said, yeah, I want this to be built. So the idea was we advocated that 
they will come. The producers will come. You will build mines. And this is what happens. $700 million to put the power line in. And you can see that it kind of goes through more or less the heart of the Golden Triangle. And that was done in two years, finished in 2014. This was instrumental to get finished for Red Chris to get built. It wouldn't have been built. This world-class mine needed a $47 million spur put into that power line, which uh, Imperial paid for. But if you didn't have that, you wouldn't have opened up this potential, which subsequently Newcrest has realized is being off the charts world-class. We cover it. I won't go into more and more detail, but I'm pretty excited. It's also opened up, if you look at the red ellipse here, the power, the power line, Northwest Transmission, opened up the ability to bring in run a river power, uh, which the Taltan are very involved with. You wouldn't have that without the grid power. And potential to continue expansion. There's probably going to be a little bit of reference to that later. So just to emphasize the added hydroelectric, and I won't go into great detail, but this is something the Toltan have embraced. They've invested $124 million. They own 5% of the entity that has this run of flow power. Skeena, uh, when they build their uh, open pit mine and mill complex, will use run of river power on to some, of some magnitude. The excess capacity is run to BC Hydro. So the question is, is the, golden, is the Yukon that it's a golden triangle. Okay, Yukon geology. Selwyn Basin, it's an older Paleozoic to Neoproterozoic basin, lots of sediments, very uh, permissive for uh, lead zinc deposits, sedimentary hosted deposits. It's also got, if you can see in the uh, yellow, that's the uh, kind of corridor of the Tintina Gold Belt, and you're gonna hear a lot more about that in other talks, I'm sure. So that's the frame of ref reference. There's the existing mines. There's three mines right now in the Yukon. Here's a couple that are high up on the development uh, project. I think BC BCM is coming in soon. So that's kind of the, so those are some of the main projects right now. So the geology in the Yukon is great. That's the punchline. And here's another emphasis, the Yukon on fire. Let's just look at some of the things happening here. Okay, the three mines in production. This is a, success, a successful heat bleach. Congratulations to John McConnell and his team. Um, Hecla is bringing to bear their underground mi mining expertise at Keno Hill. That's really important. Uh, their Lucky Friday mine in Idaho is a dead ringer in some respects. So they're going to bring to bear the deep mining skills, apply them to Yukon. There was a great talk up in the G Yukon Geoscience Forum from Hecla. Minto is starting to prioritize exploration, which they haven't for a long time. Uh, Newmont, presumably heading down the track to production at some point at coffee. Western copper um, and gold. This is a globally significant uh, copper gold porphyry. Uh, once this gets into production, it's an absolute game changer for the Yukon. Uh, Rio Tinto endorsing it, and they've, they've re-upped their one year. Look, they're doing extensive due diligence. And just to finish, uh, Snowline Gold Rogue. Uh, $25 million equity financing on the back of some visual results. Um, as Jim Bob Moffat of Freeport would say, hot damn! I mean, these results that were released in the summertime, not only visuals, but subsequently the assays, uh, 400 meters at a couple of grams, uh, 180 meters at four grams. It's, it is spectacular. And in 17 years as an analyst, I've not gone to site and been racing to publish on the plane ride back. So I can't say enough about the high conviction on that. I'm not saying it's in a perfect location right next to a road, but I'm sure you're gonna be hearing more about Snowline. Banyan, uh, got that one underlined too. Four million ounces out of nowhere. That one caught me. And I'm sure in the next resource update, that is gonna grow significantly. And, and that system's open. So I'd pay attention to that. They raised $17 million in equity. This is all in 2022. Uh, BCM with Kritzakaya, this is a critical minerals project that's on path to go into production. Uh, you're going to be hearing about that a little bit later today. Exciting. Um, and then uh, White Gold Saddle, they've got in strategic investments from both Kinross and uh, Igneco Eagle. So that's a real focus, nicely endorsed by the seniors. And last but not least, I think Fireweed Metals 
almost said zinc, is, is one to really watch. Uh, one that raised uh, $35 million, including 27 from the Lundin family. And uh, uh, that, on a global basis, delivered some of the best intercepts for zinc lead in the last 15 years. Had a good chat with Brandon McDonald about that. So just on Yukon First Nations, there's going to be other speakers throughout the day probably talking about this, so I won't go on and on, but one of the special things in the Yukon is you have 11 of the 14 are treaties. They're settled. Unlike British Columbia with one or, only one or two treaties, including the Nishka, uh, this provides some certainty. Not saying it's simple, um, but this, this, was, this gives the Yukon a very, very special uh, batting cage in terms of First Nations relationships, I think. And in my experience, I think the First Nations want responsible development in the Yukon. They want uh, a lot of what's happening in the Golden Triangle to be happening in the Yukon. They've got a little bit of revenue sharing vis-a-vis -vis the Quartz Mining Act, but it's not nearly the scale of in British Columbia. And uh, land use planning's in progress, and certainly that's, uh, that's something that would be nice to see the hurry up offense. I was involved in that in BC, and it takes time to do. It's great when you finish, uh, but it's, it's, uh, and it's important, but it, it's nice to do it a bit faster, <laughs> if possible. Okay. Infrastructure is the big gap in the Yukon for some of these big projects, including casino. Uh, I really recommend this book by Bob McDonald, The Future Is Now. Punchline is, he says, all the energy needs we have for, say, the Yukon and other projects, we already have the technology, it's the will to use the technology. An example would be nuclear, uh, modular nuclear. So let's just look at this. Uh, it is lack of significant power, but there are options. Um, the number one, option that Andrew Carnes certainly raised up the flagpole and it may be talked about here today but uh, in November was linking to that power grid that we just looked at in BC Highway 37. Uh, not a small ticket but on the other hand a game changer if that ever got implemented for the Yukon. Um, smaller nuclear, uh, modular nuclear the size of a couple semi trucks buried underground uh, runs a town of 16,000 a couple of those could probably run a decent sized mill for example, clean energy. Very provocative book, highly recommend it. Uh, transportation infrastructure for the Yukon. There are some generous, already in place agreements for funding Canal Road, Road Out to Casino. I won't get into details here, but that money's already in hand from the feds. And so there's, there's a path towards uh, transportation infrastructure in the Yukon right now. And critical minerals funding, question mark. Uh, I'll show some slides on this in a moment. Yeah, funding for those critical minerals, the top eight that have kind of been listed by the, the BC government. Okay, the Yukon momentum. Other than the company success we talked about, and I would highlight, you don't see Yukon-based explorers raising plus $15 million very often. Uh, the fact that those companies, including Banyan, Snowline, and Fireweed Metals, to name three of them, raised it kind of in the second half of the year. They got a lot of money to deploy in 2023. Okay, so lots of firepower uh, to, uh, to bring to bear, and I think the trend is going to be expiration expenditures up on a stick in 2023. So key success factors, increasing collaboration with the First Nations. I think that's happening, but that has to happen as much as possible. My, my suggestion would be to the extent they could emulate BC is maybe, maybe there's a partnership there with the marketing side of things. Maybe not, but maybe. Uh, critical minerals initiatives. Look at this map of Canada and notice uh, the Yukon has its fair share of uh, area or domains with critical minerals. Uh, focus on the red. Canadian Mineral Strategy, and they've specifically said in the Yukon, those are the areas we're going to make a focus. So, you know, a proportional basis, the Yukon is getting a fair amount of love, at least optically. There's $3.8 billion to deploy from the feds. That's going to be in infrastructure spending, project spending, and it's going to be there also to accelerate permitting, partly through First Nations collaboration. So this, these are really important things for uh, Canada and the Yukon. And the most uh, powerful message I've got uh, from the politicians, both at the federal level, 
provincial territorial is there is a will to fast track permitting. David Ebby, the premier of British Columbia in the opening remarks, pound on the table that he wants to see the permitting go faster. A uh, bit ironic that we needed, you know, we needed the critical minerals and the green economy to get it going there, but that's okay, we'll take it as a mining sector and investors. Okay, senior mining companies, um, they've come into the Yukon in the last five years in particular. I think they're gonna continue to come in and that's gonna drive this tailwind of validation. I think uh, with some uh, more strategic investments, things that are on the radar screen, potentially ones that are already there doing more M&A. Uh, I think there's everything is ripe for success and investment. And then obviously to the extent any plan gets onto the drawing board of build it and they will come vis-a-vis -vis the power uh, and a bold vision for how the Yukon could uh, facilitate large mines. Uh, that, would be, that would be fantastic and embraced by the investment community and uh, certainly the senior mining companies. Low cost power is key. Uh, and commodity prices, I think there's a positive outlook in general. Um, in 2023, I won't get into detail, but we've got a nice tailwind on that front. And then marketing by the Yukon government, uh, international thrust. I think it's important post pandemic that uh, the government along with YMA uh, gets to international conferences, whether it be down at Beaver Creek and other venues. And I was impressed certainly at the Beaver Creek conference that the, at the time the Minister for the Economy, Economic Development was there um, and uh, the most senior minister I was aware of, of any jurisdiction, uh, invited him to come to our reception and make a few comments. Uh, you could hear a pin drop when the now premier, the Honorable Ranj Pillay, spoke for two minutes. I, I, don't, I never let a politician speak more than two minutes, but it was on point and it was being there and sending the message that Yukon's open, stuff like that. But uh, having, him having been to Sight to Snowline also moved the needle, was able to make some anecdotes on that front. Okay, here's, here's an interesting argument. If you don't like the size of the Yukon Triangle versus the Golden Triangle one, here's my argument that if you look at uh, the uh, mineral resources and reserves, the Golden Triangle here for the next, you know, 40 years out to like say 30 years, sorry, 2052 is looking like between Red Crisp, Bruce Jack, SK, and Premier, going to produce about 31.8 million ounces of gold equivalent. Okay. Now, pre to that, oh, sorry, this is 2012 to 2032, 52. Sorry, pre to that, there was the 9.3. So there's the delta. I've just kind of given you the benchmark. Okay. So there's the 30 million across here. Okay, this was the Yukon, 1.4, so a shadow of that, and not a lot since then, some. The next 40 years, if Eagle, Kino Hill, Minto, Casino, and uh, Coffee, and apologies, missed Kutsukai here, so apologies, yes, noted. I did get you on the other side. If they come on board, you've got the equal amount of production. To me, that is stunning because that doesn't even include some of the emerging potential out of fireweed metals, snow line, and some of these breaking discoveries. So I think this is part of my case, is the endowment is there. Uh, it partly needs some help on the infrastructure side, but certainly Eagle is a mine, Kino Hill is a mine, Mento is a mine, casino getting built would be huge. Securing the port access beyond what its capabilities are right now is a great initiative, and hopefully that can uh, happen in Skagway, it's in Alaska, but that uh, free port, ice-free port status is really important. And in terms of our involvement, started as an analyst in 20, uh, 2005, and I didn't cover a BC company until 2017 or 2018, it was GT Gold. And part of it was a reticence on the First Nations issues. I was very versed in them, having been the president of Chamber of Mines. I wanted everything to line up well, because I want to protect investors. And reminder, we're information only. We're not making recommendations in this forum. But I want to protect investors. 
And so that was one reason I got into the Golden Triangle, it became a batting cage for the post-Macquarie world uh, the last three and a half years. Um, and then more I looked at the Yukon, certainly helped by some incredible discoveries. We pivoted to the Yukon, not only covering snow line, but also is the Yukon the next Golden Triangle, a thematic piece that covers a lot of what we talked about today, okay? Certainly willing to give anybody copies of these reports that wants them, okay? So that was driving home this thesis. And finally, in picking the winners, the Yukon is a massive theme. Safe jurisdiction globally, it's really, it's really Australia and Canada. That's, that's it in the world right now. Love the US, but it's tougher to permit down there. You've got a few more barriers. So picking the winners, certainly snow lines a top pick. Uh, and we kind of go on with all our themes, including the Yukon being a high, high theme. Okay, let's go back to the beginning here. Is the Yukon the next Golden Triangle? Um, I think I've added High Gold here, Johnson Trek with the Senior Gold endorsement in Alaska. I'm on the board of High Gold, so a little add there. Uh, Rogue is in here, which I've added. But I hope I've conveyed that there's been a big change in terms of senior mining company ingress into the Golden Triangle starting about 10 years ago. And you can see the result of that, four point four billion dollars in M&A, um, and then flowing at the Yukon. Not necessarily M&A in the Yukon or Alaska, but very compelling that seniors are coming in, and I think it's early innings in the Yukon. I, I think I had one more there, and then, yeah, disclaimer that uh, this is, this is uh, information only. Um, thank you for your time, and that's who we are, Dentist Capital. I've got 38 seconds left, so thank you for your attention.